We're uh, going to be in chapter 8 of Paul Little's book, Know Why You Believe. And it's uh, been good, really good, going through this book on apologetics. So I hope you have your Bibles too. We're going to be looking in the Gospel of John tonight. So if you want to get a head start on that, you can flip over to John chapter 2. And let's ask for God's blessing on our time together. Father, as we gather here tonight, we want to thank you that we can meet in this place. Thank you for the blessings, the comforts that you give us. And uh, thank you for this country that we live in and um, the, the time that we live in as well. We want to pray for those who are hurting tonight and are also less fortunate. We want to pray for those that are uh, affected by the earthquake in Nepal and the surrounding area. And just pray, oh God, for... Uh, your help. And and again, um, we know that you, as your word says, can bring good out of such tremendous disasters. And uh, we want to pray for our country and just ask for um, hearts that would turn to you. Uh, The unrest that we're seeing right now in Baltimore, which is again, just a a repeat of what we've seen happening over the last number of months. Uh, We know that uh, the real, the real need is, is uh, our hearts being turn back to you and uh, we know that when that foundation is set that um, good will naturally come and so we just pray for that for our country we look forward to next week and the national day of prayer and uh, just pray that it would draw hearts to you and uh, draw us closer in our relationships with you i pray in all of the affluence that we have in this country and the um, luxury that we have i pray that you would help us not be uh, choked out by those things, but that you would help us uh, to recognize that our joy and strength is in our relationship with you and that that would continue to grow and flourish, we ask. Please bless our time together. Please guide us and inspire our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is number eight, chapter number eight in Paul Little's book, Know Why You Believe. We've gone through uh, the previous chapters, beginning from chapter one is Christianity Rational, where we looked at faith and the evidence that our faith rests upon. And then chapter two, Is There a God? And we looked around at the order and design that we have in our world, in our universe. Is Christ God? We began to look into the Bible and see what the scriptures have to say about the deity of Jesus We looked at the evidences for the resurrection in chapter 4, did Christ rise from the dead? And then chapters 5 and 6, is the Bible God's word? Are the Bible documents reliable? We looked at the inspiration of scripture as the Bible claims to be inspired. We talked about prophecy and uh, the fulfillment of prophecy. We talked about the canon, what books were chosen to be in the Bible and what books were excluded. And we looked at the reliability of the Bible by uh, looking at the manuscript evidence that speaks for uh, what we have today being the words that were written down so many years ago. And then last week, you guys were blessed with Pastor Ryan doing the study on archeology. span Does archeology span verify scripture? And we see with archeology span that it substantiates the people and places that are named in the Bible. And so we've come to chapter eight where we're looking at miracles, the miraculous. Are miracles possible? And as we talk about that, uh, I, I was looking at it, and this is really one of the first times in going through a, a study on apologetics that miracles have come up that have really kind of dove in as far as a topic goes. But I realized that when, when you look at the miraculous, you're looking at something that's beyond the natural. I think we would agree, something that's more supernatural. And, and it brings us into that arena kind of like uh, fulfilled prophecy, where you recognize with fulfilled prophecy somebody knows something beyond what we can know as mere uh, common human beings. And it it argues, fulfilled prophecy argues for the divine inspiration of scripture. And so when you come to the miraculous, you're you're getting a strong argument for someone who is beyond the human capabilities that we have. And so we see that in the workings of God throughout the Bible, uh, especially in Jesus, but throughout the Bible. I wanted to start off with our concept of God and look at the very beginning of chapter 8 in Paul's Little's book, Know Why You Believe. So if you've got your book and you want to turn to page 126, I'd like to start at the bottom of the page 
and uh, look at our concept of God. Page 126, our concept of God. Questions about the credibility of miracles extend also to the validity of predictive prophecy or any supernatural act. All of these questions stem from a concept of God who is conceived of as human, not divine. Once we assume the existence and character of God, miracles are no longer a problem. God is by definition all-powerful. In the absence of such a God, the concept of miracles becomes difficult, if not impossible, to entertain. And that's what we have to recognize, that God isn't bound by natural law. He created it, and he can transcend it. We have to remember that God is not human. He's not natural, if you will. He's supernatural. And so if we tend to think of God as like us, then we're not going to believe in miracles. But when we recognize that he is so far beyond us, miracles really are not a problem. Uh, What is a miracle? A miracle is an act of God, God breaking into, changing, or interrupting the ordinary course of things. Norman Geisler wrote in The Apologetics of Jesus, natural laws describe what occurs regularly by natural causes, but miracles are special acts of God that interrupt the normal course of events and confirm the word of God through a messenger of God. Biblical miracles confirmed faith. They authenticate, when you think about it, the messenger and also the message that the messenger is bringing. We look again throughout the scriptures and we see God doing the miraculous through different individuals. Moses is an example. When God called Moses in Exodus chapter 3 to go rescue his people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, Moses questioned God and said, well, what if they... What if they don't believe me? And remember, God said to Moses, what is that that you have in your hand? And he said, a rod, cast the rod on the ground, and the rod became a serpent. They would believe through the miraculous. And so there was the rod that turned to the serpent. There was, remember, Moses' hand as he he put it inside his cloak and pulled it out. It was leprous, and then he put it in and brought it out again. It would be made whole. They were signs, the water being turned to blood. They were signs that were to convince the people that this is, in fact, a messenger of God and to believe his message. It's kind of neat when you think about that. And when you start to, to look at how the miracles were being used, we fast forward and we look at the days of Elijah and we see where he had that competition on Mount Carmel uh, between he himself and the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And you remember it was the creating of a sacrifice before their gods And whichever God answered by fire, the miraculous, was the true God. And we remember the story of the prophets of Baal crying out to Baal and Baal never answering. There was no miracle that took place. But when Elijah cried out to the true and living God and God answered by fire, again, the miracle, the supernatural, remember the impact it had on the people that were there. They cried out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And so there was a change through the miraculous. It was the miracle that was validating the messenger and the message that the messenger was bringing. It's kind of neat to to understand how miracles were being used. And we come to the life of Jesus and we see that the miraculous confirmed who he was as well. And I've got a number of examples here that I wanted to take a look at. In John chapter 2, if you've turned over there, here, the miracle that Jesus performed, and it was really his first miracle in uh, Cana of Galilee when they're at the wedding. It's this miracle that causes his disciples to put their trust in him. If we look at John chapter 2 and just jump down to verse 11 of John chapter 2, it says, This beginning of signs, after Jesus turned the water into wine, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested or revealed his glory, and notice, and his disciples believed in him. So Jesus is bringing a message, but when the miraculous starts, the disciples recognize that there's something, there's something about him that's beyond the norm, beyond the common man, and it seems like it's the tipping point where they put their trust in him, where they begin to believe in him. Look at the next chapter in chapter 3, 
This is where Nicodemus the Pharisee comes to Jesus. It says in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Isn't that neat to kind of focus in on that? I mean, how many times has we, have we read John chapter 3, but focusing on the topic of miracles, we see that it was the miraculous that was affecting the people and their concept of who Jesus, who Jesus was. And so it's validating the messenger and then, of course, opening up ears to, to hear what the message is. And so you have a, a man like Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. How about that? Who was one of the religious leaders who actually was impacted by Jesus, impacted by his words. But again, it was the miraculous, the signs that he was doing that was bringing that, that confidence, I think, to him and to so many that there was something different about him. Uh, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, to the crowd at the Feast of Pentecost, as he gets up and begins to tell the people about Jesus, and of course, all the people knew about Jesus. It, it had been only 50 days from the previous Passover where Jesus was crucified and then rose from the dead. It had only been 50 days. They're at the Feast of Pentecost, and you've got all the people gathered from all over the Roman Empire that are back in Jerusalem. Most likely these people were there at the Feast of Passover because these are two of the three feasts that they were required to go to. So, so undoubtedly they knew who Jesus was. They undoubtedly knew what had taken place at that time. Well, Peter uses this opportunity as the Holy Spirit has come upon the church to be able to preach Jesus to the people. And he says, just one verse here in Acts 2.22, men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, notice, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. And I'm just taking that passage right there and not going beyond it, but just taking that passage to show that, that Peter is saying that Jesus was attested by God. He was validated by God through the miracles that God was doing through him. And he makes the point, you guys know this. You guys know the miracles that he was doing. And so that's pretty neat. They would sit back and they go, yeah, we did. We did know what he was doing. And this was God, again, putting his stamp of approval, if you will, on who Jesus is through the miraculous that was taking place. If you're still in the Gospel of John, if you want to turn up to John chapter 10, this is where the Jews are questioning Jesus as to whether he is the Christ. And of course, he has been communicating and teaching among them this message of salvation and of course, communicating as well who he is. So if we look at John chapter 10 and we begin from verse 24, it says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. I've told you, I've communicated this truth to you. It's the works that I'm doing. The works that I do in my Father's name, they are bearing witness. They're the testimony. Again, the miraculous being the validation of the messenger and thus the message that's coming forth from the messenger. Keep going forward to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, this is the last night that Jesus is with his disciples, the night that he would be betrayed. And here he's with his disciples in the upper room, giving his final words to them. And this is in response to Philip's request to see the Father. And Jesus says in John 14, let's look at verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Verse 11, believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Again, speaking of the miracles that are taking place. Let the miracles be that which convinces you. How about that? I, I never really noticed it at near as much 
uh, as I have as the topic has been presented before us in this book. As we're looking at, what are we looking at? We're looking at why we believe what we believe. When we look to the word of God, we see the miraculous. When we look to Jesus, we see, well, when you think, just think about reading through the gospels, there's miracles taking place all the time. I mean, Jesus, and, and wouldn't we expect that if Jesus is who he claimed to be, if he is the son of God, you would kind of expect the supernatural. And that's what we see throughout his life. And I think we've come to, to accept it as common because we're so familiar with the gospels. But when you see what he does, and we'll be talking about the things that he did during those three and a half years of ministry, I mean, his life was just, was filled with the miraculous. And as we see the effect of that, it was drawing people to him and putting that stamp of approval upon him, if we can use it that way. Jesus' miracles reflect his divine character. They demonstrate his power over creation. Now, this one you're going to have to focus in because I don't have uh, anything up on the screen for you for this, but this is out of The Apologetics of Jesus by Norman Geisler and Patrick Zucharin. And I wanted to read a couple of paragraphs out of this. And so if you could focus in as I read about the miracles reflecting his power over creation. When he establishes his kingdom on earth, all creation will be subject to him. Sin, sickness, death, and disease will ultimately be overcome and the subjects of his kingdom will never be in want. The king will supply all their needs. Of course, we think about when he sets up the kingdom age, the millennial reign, and how it's going to be like Garden of Eden conditions during that time. It's his power that's bringing all of that into subjection to himself. It's Satan bound, Christ's power over the enemy during that time, the longevity of life, even all of creation affected by that. You go into Revelation 21 and you've got a, a brand new heaven and earth. And, and what do we have? We have the end of pain. We have the end of sorrow and sadness. No more tears. Death is gone because the king is the one who is on the throne. And so his divine character as we see to come and yet as we look back and see in his life, I'll read on, Jesus performs several miracles that demonstrate his supernatural, first of all, his supernatural knowledge. In the calling of Nathanael, in John chapter 1, Christ reveals his knowledge of Nathanael's location and even his thoughts. If you remember, it was Philip that went to get Nathanael, and as Nathanael is coming, Philip tells him, we, we found Jesus of Nazareth, the one that Moses spoke about. And Nathaniel's like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he's skeptical as he's coming. And as he comes, Jesus said to Nathaniel, behold, a, a true Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And that takes Nathaniel back. And he said, how do you know me? Remember, Jesus' response was, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. And what that did in Nathaniel, and, and wh- what does that mean? I mean, all we can do is speculate Maybe this was his secret prayer closet. Maybe this is the place Nathaniel went and Jesus knew that place and he knew Nathaniel. And in Nathaniel's mind, it had such a profound impact on him. His response was, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So it had to be something well beyond just Jesus was looking from around the corner and saw him under the fig tree. It had an impact. Again, his knowledge, his knowledge, the omniscience that took took place there in John chapter 4 the woman at the well we remember that story in John chapter 4 Jesus reveals his knowledge of the Samaritan woman's life when he says that she had five previous husbands and is presently living with the man who is not her husband and as a result she reports to her fellow townspeople come see a man who told me everything I ever did could this be the Christ so by his supernatural knowledge the miraculous, the result it had on this woman is, could this be somebody, again, beyond just a human being, but in fact, the Christ. Jesus' special knowledge of individuals and events demonstrates that he's capable of exercising his divine attribute of omniscience. Another topic here, Jesus demonstrates that as creator, 
He has authority over the natural world. Examples of this authority are seen when he calms the storm, Luke chapter 8. When he transforms water into wine, John chapter 2. And walks on water, John chapter 6. As Jehovah the healer, Christ demonstrates authority over disease. He cures leprosy, Matthew 8. Blindness, Mark 10 and John 9. Sickness, John chapter 4. And physical infirmities, John chapter 5. As Lord over all creation, Christ's authority extends even over the spiritual realm. He demonstrates power over demonic forces by exercising them from two men in the region of the Gadarenes, Matthew 8, from a boy with an evil spirit, Mark 9, and from the Gerasene demoniac, Luke chapter 8. And as we think about it, and these stories roll through our minds as I'm reading through this, you can see that that's the life of Jesus, isn't it? He was the one who knew what was going on in the hearts of men. He was the one who could touch those who needed healing, and they were healed. He was the one who had power over the demonic forces and set the people free. As Yahweh the provider, Jesus demonstrates his ability to provide for the people's needs. He feeds a crowd of 5,000, remember that, Matthew chapter 14, and later a crowd of 4,000, Matthew chapter 15. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus performs the miracle of the miraculous catch of fish. The provision of food parallels God providing for his people during the exodus from Egypt. Hey, there's the miraculous as well. Centered around Moses' day with the plagues of Egypt and then the parting of the Red Sea and coming out into the uh, wilderness where God would provide for them all of the food that they needed as they were there 40 years in the wilderness. And you see Jesus doing similar things where he's got the miraculous food that he's bringing forth to care for and, and meet the needs of the people that are there. Jesus shows his authority over sin and its effects in Mark chapter 2. Upon seeing the paralytic lowered before him, Jesus declares to the man's son, your sins are forgiven. The Jewish leaders hearing this are offended because they know only God has the authority to forgive sins, which means Jesus is claiming to exercise the authority reserved for God. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus responds, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Thus, Jesus presents a physical demonstration to the audience of his authority over sin. And so the miraculous in forgiving sins is demonstrated through the miraculous of healing the paralytic. That is so cool, isn't it? And so, again, why, why are we talking? That's what I had to keep coming back to. Why are we talking about miracles? And the reason why, it's showing this is the word of God that is beyond the natural. It is supernatural. And we see that as a, as a, a testimony, really, to uh, the divine author that's behind the scriptures. And, of course, the Son of God who has come to heal us of our infirmity, namely sin, and validating his ministry through the miraculous. Jesus also, this is the final paragraph, Jesus is also the source of life. He demonstrates this by raising several people from the dead. They include Jairus' daughter, Mark chapter 5, the widow's son in the town of Nain, Luke chapter 7, and Lazarus and John chapter 11. Through this wide variety of miracles, Jesus demonstrates his authority over every realm of creation. The vast array of Christ's miracles confirms he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In short, miracles are used repeatedly as Christ's apologetics to confirm and defend his message. So omniscience, power over nature, over demons, over sin, and of course over death. Now, therein is Jesus, the apostles as well, as we've been looking at Moses, Elijah, Jesus, the apostles we see as well that their ministry was confirmed by miracles. I just thinking about the book of Acts, and I know there's a lot of the miraculous that took place there. We look at Peter raising Dorcas or or Tabitha from uh, the dead in Acts chapter 9. Paul healing the lame man at Lystra in Acts chapter 14. And in Acts chapter 19, remember the handkerchiefs that were taken from Paul to even the sick, and they were healed. So God working in a variety of ways, but working again through his messengers that we're bringing a message. And I I think that, again, is the root behind why are there all the miracles? You know, were they simply for entertainment's sake so people can be entertained? I don't think so. I think every time you see it, it's showing 
that this is God's messenger and listen to the message, whether it's Moses going to rescue them out of Egypt, whether it's Elijah trying to turn the people back to the true and living God, Jesus bringing forth the truth of our need of salvation, and of course the apostles looking back to Jesus and what he has done for us. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, looking at the apostles, the messengers of the Lord themselves, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. This would be his followers, the apostles. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So again, the idea of the miraculous here confirming the message that God's messengers were bringing forth to them. Now, everything that I'm bringing right now is coming out of the Bible, okay? So we're, we're looking at stories in the Bible. We're looking at Exodus, and we're, we're looking at 1 Kings, and we're looking at the Gospels, and we're looking at the book of Acts. And so it's all coming out of this book right here. What we need to remember, and this is the whole point of why we're going through this series, is that the Bible is a historically accurate document that we've already begun and are laying down a foundation that we can put our trust in what this document has to say. We've looked at manuscript evidence to try and answer the question, do we have the same words that were penned 2,000 plus years ago? And, and the answer to that is, is yes, you've got to at least admit that the manuscripts that we have back up the idea that we have got the same book that was written. It doesn't contradict the concept that we have the same book. It backs up the idea that we have the same book. And within this book, again, we need to recognize that we have got fulfilled prophecy, prophecy that's been spoken and it has come to pass. That is such a powerful argument for the divine inspiration of the Bible. That, that answers the question, was this written by men? So there are some really good, solid arguments, reasons for the faith that we have in this book. So now hopefully there's a little bit more uh, of a trust that, that we can have in the Bible, that we can come to it and go, well, look, the Bible says this. And rather than sitting back with an air of doubt and go, well, how can we be sure that's true? Well, hopefully we're covering some of those areas so that we can go, yeah, you know, I can put all of these together and, and go, there, there's a lot of, I use this line a lot, there's a, a lot of facts that our faith rests upon. And so here we're looking into God's word and we're, we're seeing the miraculous in, um, I think it was in Paul Little's book, Reasons We May Know That the Miracles Have Adequate and Reliable Testimony. Here's five of them. Jesus's miracles were done in public. It's not like we're reading stories about he did something in a private home and every time he did something miraculous, nobody was around. He was doing these things in public. On top of that, they were done before unbelievers. That's a hostile witness. In other words, people who aren't already believing in Jesus, they don't believe in him, and yet they would validate. They would say, yes, he in fact did these things. Jesus' miracles were carried out through three years of ministry covering a variety of powers, and we spoke a lot of the, of the variety already of the miracles that he did. The testimony of the cured is undeniable. And the miracles are extraordinary and unique. I want to go back to Paul Little's book and this time go to page 135 as we're looking at the reasons we may know that the miracles have adequate and reliable testimony. Page 135. And we're going to be in the paragraph that starts fifth. Okay, again, this is reasons. that we may know that the miracles have adequate, adequate, reliable testimony. Page 135, starting with the word fifth. Fifth, compared to non-Christian religions, these New Testament accounts of Jesus of Nazareth are extraordinarily unique in an entirely different category with an entirely different purpose. They are but a part of an entire authentic message. His birth, his message of forgiveness, his death and resurrection... Miracles are usually believed in other religions because the religion is already believed. But in the biblical religion, miracles are part of the means 
of establishing the true religion. This distinction is of immense importance. Israel was brought into existence by a series of miracles. The first five books of the Old Testament were surrounded by supernatural wonders. Many of the prophets were identified as God's spokesmen by their power to perform miracles. Jesus came not only preaching, but performing miracles. And the apostles from time to time worked wonders. It was the miracle authenticating the religion at every point. It's interesting, isn't it? Again, the miraculous is what caught the attention of the disciples and they put their trust in him. It was the miraculous that got Nicodemus' attention and so forth. And as we look through the entirety of the Bible, you go to the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And like I've said before, if you can believe that first verse of the Bible, miracles will be no problem at all. (laughs) You know what I mean? If he created everything, then what's the big deal about miracles? And and people, there, there are people, there are Christians that have trouble with miracles because it goes beyond the natural laws that we have in our world. God's the one who created the natural laws. He's the one that can transcend the natural laws. And again, if you come back to the very beginning that he created everything, everything else that we read is, is no problem whatsoever. You come to some of the, the, quote, difficulties that some people have. You come to the flood of Noah's day. And it's really not a problem if God created everything in the beginning. He can flood the earth. You know, some people will say, well, there's not enough water on the earth to, to flood. And, and I'll tell you what, having been on a boat last week, there's a lot of water out there. And I understand the argument, but, but I was just amazed. Most of the time you could see land, but a lot of the time you couldn't. Just to see how much water is out there. And then we're just seeing a tiny little thimble full in comparison to, to what's on the face of the earth. And the, the entirely different world that's underneath the surface of the water God is so amazing, isn't he? I mean, how many people actually see what's down there, and yet God creates all of this in in such unique, uh, in just such a unique way. Um, But anyway, how could that much water? That is a a valid uh, criticism that people have if the mountains were already as high as they are right now. But I, I think there's biblical support to show that they weren't that high, that in the flood of Noah's day, it says as the waters receded, that the waters went down into the subterranean caverns and that pushed the land masses up during that time. And can you imagine how loosey-goosey the whole world was during the time of the flood? And so uh, I think the, the suggestion would be we didn't have the high mountains during the time of the flood, and so there would be plenty of water to cover the face of the earth for a global flood. But again, we come back to how big is God, you know? Did he create the heavens and the earth? I believe he did. Uh, Did he cause a global flood to take place in the days of Noah? I believe he did. What about Jonah and the whale? First of all, it wasn't a whale. It says it was a great fish that God prepared to swallow Jonah. So if God can create the heavens and the earth, can he create a fish specifically for that purpose? He can't. And, and what about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where you have fire and brimstone that's being rained down? And what about Lot's wife that was turned to a pillar of salt? I mentioned all of these specifically because these are the ones that sometimes Christians shy away from when they're talking with someone else because, oh, they sound like, they sound like mythology in little kids' storybooks, where in reality, Jesus mentioned every single one of those stories that I just mentioned. How about that? He brought validity to those historical events by merely, by merely referring to them as actual historical events. And again, the problem isn't with the event. The problem is with Jesus, if we have a problem with that, because he was all about that. So how big is God? And that's the idea, our concept of God. Is he big enough? Is he able? He is. And of course, the the ultimate really is Jesus' resurrection because it is the resurrection that our faith is founded upon. It's the fact that he conquered death. 
you know, when somebody's struggling with the miraculous, it's one thing to go, well, I don't know about, you know, creation and, and I don't know about the flood and everything. Well, what about the resurrection? I mean, that is just as miraculous that he came back to life, never to die again, never to die again. And that's what our faith is, is founded upon. And so God is more than powerful enough to accomplish all that we've been talking about and much, much more. I think it was in Paul's book where he made mention that some try and give natural explanations for the miracles that we read about, uh, psychosomatic, mind over matter, healings. And, you know, we see some of that today where somebody's constantly sick and it's just a mental thing and they can get over it. But, you know, the things that Jesus was healing people from, blindness, being born blind and having leprosy, it's, it's not a, a mind over matter issue. I remember reading when uh, I was teaching through the book of Exodus about the um, parting of the Red Sea and how some liberal commentators will go, well, you know, it might not have been the Red Sea as we know it. It might have been the Reed Sea, which is in the area, but it was just a matter of water that was about knee deep, and the wind came up, and it blew the water away, and they crossed over. And, of course, the, the, the response to that is always, well, the real miracle then is that God drowned the entire Egyptian army in knee deep water. Uh, you go back to the account, and you find that it specifically says when they crossed through the Red Sea, it was a wall of water on the left hand and the right hand, and they crossed on dry ground. When you think about that, I mean, you've got the, you've got the bed of a sea that they're going through. I mean, they're not sloshing through the mud. It is dry ground. This whole thing is the miraculous that God is doing because he is bringing his people to himself. And so natural explanations, uh, are uh, they fall short. Another question that comes up is, we read about the miraculous. Why aren't we seeing that today? Why aren't we seeing it on the scale that we read about it in the Bible today? And that's, that's a good question. You know, I'm not saying the miraculous doesn't happen. I, I believe that it is happening. But I, I wonder, as we've been looking at this and talking about miracles doing what? They're validating the message that the messenger is bringing. I wonder if part of the reason is that we've got the message, we've got the completed canon of scripture. God spoke to the fathers by the prophets in times past, and in these last days he's spoken to us through his son. And so we have the words of Jesus, we have the testimony of those who saw him, the apostles, written down for us so that we're reading, we're talking all about it. I wonder if that's part of the reason, in all seriousness. I also wonder if maybe the reason we don't see the miraculous as much is because we live in such an affluent society right now where we don't need God for healing. We just go to the doctor where we don't need God to protect us. We just break out our, our guns or if we need our savings account. I wonder if that's why you hear more stories of the miraculous in third world countries where they have nothing but God to hang on to. I'm just thinking out loud as well as reading off my notes too, but just wondering if, if maybe both of those factor in somewhat in that. And I like the question that came up in the book, would miracles really change someone's mind anyway? You know, if someone was saying, well, you know, if I just saw a miracle, then I'd become a believer. And I think of the passage in Luke chapter 16, where it was the rich man and Lazarus and they both died and and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom and he's being comforted and the rich man went to Hades a great gulf separating the two the rich man's in in uh, a place of torment and he's beseeching Abraham to send Lazarus back to talk to uh, his family that he has that if he sees him they'll believe because of the miraculous in Luke 16 verses 29 through 31 Abraham said to him they have Moses And the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And I wonder if that's the same today. Would a miracle really make that much difference? We have got God's word. We have got so much that this word rests upon it's, it's always going to be a matter of faith. We're going through this series on apologetics, know why we believe. There's always going to be that element of faith that we're coming to God, believing in the one that we don't visibly see with our eyes. We're trusting in him, but again, he's given us a lot of reason, 
a lot of reason to trust in him. So would a miracle really change it? According to this right here, this comparison, I would say no. The Christian believes God exists, has originated natural law, can make or break it, can intervene or not. We, we come with that bias, don't we? We believe God exists. We believe he created the heavens and the earth, and we believe he can do according to his own will and through his own power. The agnostic or the atheistic scientist believes God does not and cannot exist. And so that is the bias that, that they come from. Therefore, their judgments are based on naturalistic and materialistic observation, believing there's really no other option. So we really come to the table, everyone does, with a certain kind of bias that we have. As we look at the same evidence, and so what is the conclusion that we come to as we lay the evidence before us? Let's read from uh, Paul's book again on page 139, and this is going to be wrapping it up here in our study concerning miracles, miracles, page 139 of know why you believe. At the very bottom of the page, the last paragraph, as a, as a summary of thoughts on miracles, we have seen the miracles in the Bible as an inherent part of God's communication to us, not a mere appendage of little significance. It also takes us back again to the ultimate question, does God exist? Settle that question, and miracles cease to be a problem. The very uniformity against which a miracle stands in stark contrast depends on an omnipotent author of natural law who is also capable of transcending it to accomplish his sovereign ends. Miracles. <laughs> 